This is Money Talk Tuesday, Financial Relief and Protection and Planning, featuring our lovely ladies from EF Financial um, and the Office of Economic Empowerment. I'm going to show you guys a little uh, slideshow. There we go. So with a little quick agenda, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the Office of Economic Empowerment is, go over some disclosures and housekeeping, um, and then I'll introduce EF Financial and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Well, there'll be Q&A throughout this, but we'll get to that point. <laughs> about the Office of Economic Empowerment, um, OEE is a department within the Office of the Treasurer and Receiver General um, of Massachusetts Tax with supporting advocate advocating and facilitating policies that empower all Massachusetts residents. Our programs serve women, families, high school students, veterans, and seniors. And our priorities include closing the wage gap, increasing access to financial education, and improving college affordability. Uh, oh, and investing in STEM careers and education. The disclosures I'm going to read to you kind of just go over um, what what um, what will be happening. Sorry, this is a Zoom webinar and will be recorded, so we're recording live right now. The recording may be uploaded onto public websites for future use, and this webinar will also be live streamed on Facebook. Any information shared through our through the question functions will be anonymous. Please note, however, the chat record is subject to public record laws and as such is not anonymous. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member FINRA, SIPC. So for housekeeping, um, this is a webinar, it's not a meeting, so you won't be able to see other participants um, and you won't be able to uh, handle any of your camera functions. If you do have a question, you can raise your hand or you can put it into the Q&A uh, button at the end, at the bottom of your screen usually. If you're on the app, there's a Q&A option. Um, you can communicate to the rest of the attendees and the panelists through your chat feature. Um, but like I said before, that one will show your name. Q&As can be anonymous. The Q&A is available throughout the webinar, and as we see them, we will address them. And um, we will be sending out a post survey with some links and a little bit about um, what we covered today, if you're looking for any of that information to follow. So please, when you exit out of here, there will be a survey that will pop up. If you don't mind just taking a second and filling it out, it helps us um, better develop these webinars for you guys. And then finally, this is thank you from the Office of Economic Empowerment. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, you can email us at moneytalk at tre.state.ma.us. And you can also follow us on Facebook. We also have a Twitter, uh, but we live stream these events on Facebook. So like I said, follow us on <laughs> Facebook. And then also you can take a screenshot of this. This is our upcoming agenda for May. You see today we have um, EF Financial pro providing us with financial relief protection and planning. Our next one will be about navigating student debt, small business tips and resources the following week, and then we'll be talking about how to teach your kids about money. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to our lovely presenters. Thank you, Shai. Appreciate it. Um, I'm Rachel Conroy, and I'm here with Erica Felbloom. And we are the team at EF Financial. We're a financial planning and investment management practice, and we're based in Charlestown. Uh, we work with individuals to help them manage their finances through all phases of their lives. And I'm shy and everyone, we are so grateful to be here today to have a conversation with you about finance during this unprecedented time um, of COVID-19. Yeah, um, we just want to thank the Office of Economic Empowerment for putting these programs together. This is the fourth one. It's a really critical time and people really need the help. So thank you to uh, Kristen at the Financial Planning Association and to Shai and to the office um, for bringing this great content. Yeah, we're excited to be here. And, you know, just to start off, you know, here we are, we're 
in week eight of our stay at home order. And thinking backwards over the past seven weeks, it's like, it's amazing to think how resilient we are based on what we've overcome. And we think about homeschooling our kids and sort of creating this new normalcy and schedule for them and getting food on the table. And Erica, you and I are talking about, you know, how the beginning of this, like getting toilet paper in the bathroom was like overwhelming, but hopefully we all made it through that. You know, we're working from home or maybe we're working outside of the home because we're an essential worker. And we just want to say thank you to everyone out there working so hard, or maybe you've lost your job or you've been furloughed. And here we are, we've made it this far. We've gotten through what I kind of think of that initial um, frantic phase. And now we've created some new routines for ourselves and we've been managing our finances uh, this whole time. And it's like, now what? So what we do know is that the stay at home order has been extended tentatively through May 18. And the big question is how does our life go on after that date? How, you know, both mentally and financially, um, or even worse, Erica, you and I are talking, how do you prepare yourself for the possibility that there's an extension to that May 18th date? Well, I was listening to um, NPR yesterday, the morning program, and Bob Oaks asked the gentleman he was interviewing, it was a Dr. Um, Hamer, I think his name was, about Massachusetts and how we're reacting um, to the virus. And he asked him point blank, do you think that uh, the stay at home orders will be extended past May 18th? And he did say that he thought that they very much would be. Now it doesn't mean that that's true, but oh I think at this point, the important thing question for everyone to ask ourselves is how do we keep our finances in order and on track during these times where we don't really know what the next phase is going to look like? Right, there's just so much uncertainty. And I think the first answer, what comes to mind for me is one of the immediate things we can do is continue to take advantage of the stimulus programs that are out there as a result of the CARES Act or the Coronavirus Aid, um, Relief and Economic Security Act that was signed into law by Congress back in March. So hopefully we all are familiar with this and the fact that the, one of the main key components of the act was the, the stimulus payments that have gone out. Now, I know a lot of people that I've talked to have received stimulus payments, but I'm really curious with everyone out there today, we have a poll question just to kind of get an idea if you have received a, st a stimulus payment. I'm shy, maybe you could bring up the poll question for everyone to participate in. And then we're also asking if you didn't, if you answered you haven't received a stimulus check, you know, what, what option applies to you just to give us an, a sense as to maybe why you're not receiving it. And then Shai, if there are any questions, we're certainly open to answering any questions while we wait for submissions to the questions. I'll give some, I'll give you guys a opportunity to put some questions in the Q and A box while we wait for folks to answer our questions. So feel free either in the Q&A or in the chat. I have one question. Okay. Or yes, I received a PPP loan from my bank and it says that the forgiveness is for 75% of for payroll. I have 1099 contractors. Will this count? Um, so the 75, so in order for your loan to be forgiven, 75% of the money needs to be for your payroll. But if that's how you pay your employees through a 1099, then that would count as your payroll, I believe. Um, so that is um, something I believe, yes, so of course, you're going to want to check a lot of these rules, you know, the, the, the written and the interpretation of what they are is going to be unfolding as time goes on. And as that eight weeks goes by and you will have to um, apply for the loan to be forgiven. And 
whoever you got your loan from can also give you guidance on that. So it's sort of a, yes, it should be, but it's a wait to see how that really plays out in the real, real world. Erica, isn't it true that the amount of the loan that you got was reflective of what your payroll was? Yeah, you had to submit proof of your payroll. And if that's how you submitted your proof, then that should count. But should, I mean, these are all uncertain times. We've never done this before, so. Um, I have another question that says, if I owe taxes, would I receive the stimulus payment? Yes, you should still have received a stimulus payment even if you owe taxes. I think the only liability that would prohibit you from getting the stimulus check is if you owed back child support. Yeah. What happens if you don't spend all the funds? Will the portion you do spend still be eligible for forgiveness? I think this is going back to the PPP loan. Oh. Yeah, which I, I, the PPP loan is something different than the stimulus, personal stimulus checks. It's just not to confuse everyone. So if you, you have to spend the funds in order for it to be forgiven. And you they have to spend it on your payroll. Yeah, 75% yeah, on your payroll. And the other 25% can be spent on um, things like your rent or mortgage, utilities, telephone, things that you need to spend to keep your business running. And if you don't spend the money, then I think you have to pay it back um, you know, over the, the terms of the loan, which I believe are is maybe they give you two years to pay it back um, with a 1% interest rate. And I would just make sure you check with your lender too. They're gonna know the specifics of your terms. Okay, here we have some results. So the question was, have you received your stimulus payment? We have about 36% that did receive their stimulus payment by direct deposit. No one has received a paper check yet. Um, and no, 64 have not received any stimulus payment. So the next question, which is, which is really interesting, if you have not received a stimulus check, please select the options that apply to you. 41% um, are eligible and have been successful with the tool. And Erica, I know you're gonna bring us to the tool. Um, eligible, 23% have been eligible, but do not know the status of the payment. We're gonna help you all out today. 5% um, don't know if they're eligible and 32% are not eligible. So it's really a very diverse response here for sure. Um, um. So to address the eligibility issue, just to let you know that it is a income test. So as a single person, if your adjusted gross income is less than $99,000, and if you're a married filing joint and your adjusted gross income is less than $198,000, then you'll receive all or part of the stimulus. And also don't forget, if you have um, dependent children under the age of 17, you'll also get $500 per child. And the stimulus, as you know, is $1,200. So um, many people um, have received it. And um, let's actually go to the website to see so you can see. Um, yeah, I think if we do, if you can bring that up, Erica, we can do an exercise so everyone can see. You can check the status and um, understand maybe where you're to, you know, your re uh, resources are if you haven't received anything. And for those of you, because I know no one had said they received a paper check. Um, I know they're going out. They were sort of the last um, group of funds to go out. Everything sort of went direct deposit first and the checks went out. And I know that they're out there. And actually, um, anecdotally, this on Saturday, I got a stimulus check in the mail made payable to someone or addressed to someone other than myself, but it did have my address on it. So I was on a mission on Saturday to find out who this belonged to. I called like several people in my town because I just desperately wanted them to get their check. So they just, the IRS had the wrong address on file and thank goodness I was diligent enough to deliver their check to them on Saturday and sort of made their weekend, which was really great. So I know the checks are going out. You have some good karma coming back to you, Rachel. I hope so, I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, so what we're looking at right now is the IRS website. And that's irs.gov. And this is the landing page that you come on to um, when you sign on. So um, what you want to do is get, uh, click right here where it says get coronavirus tax relief. 
and that brings you to this page. And you see the economic impact payments. That's the official word for stimulus check. And here is where you would check your payment status. So you wanna check your payment status right now. There were some people who said that they didn't know if they were eligible. There's mm -hmm. a link right here where you can determine whether or not you are eligible or not, uh, if, if you have questions beyond the income limits. And um, then you would scoot down here and get your payment. And this is where you would click and this would tell you where you're at in the process of um, reach, getting your, your stimulus check. Um, so there's, it's chalk filled with questions and answers that would maybe pertain to your particular situation. And um, if uh, otherwise, um, there was, uh, so if, I guess if you, there was a deadline today, May 5th, where, and it was at noon, which was when we started this um, webinar, where you could uh, enter some more information as far as new checking accounts go, but that portal is now closed. Uh, that's the bad news, but the good news is that when you do file your tax return in 20, next year for this tax year, 2020, that you can apply and get your stimulus check at that time. So, yeah, so if you didn't update your information, it might be too late, but don't worry, you will ultimately be credited or receive that stimulus, but when you file next year. For yeah. Okay. So, I right. mean, you need it now, you also need it then. But, um, end of the, but bottom line, I would certainly go and um, check to see, you know, check your status just to see where things stand. Shia, did you have a question? Yes, we have a couple of questions. So okay. one is I have not received my stimulus, a stimulus check. When I try to update my info on the website, it says information cannot be found. Why do you think that may be? I filed my taxes and I know I owe, but as you all said, it shouldn't matter, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of Q and A's, uh, frequently asked questions on that IRS um, website that kind of addresses these issues. And just remember they're processing so many of these checks that you could just be um, in process. That was one of the answers. So um, I would just check on a daily basis. They only update it once a day, so you don't need to go in multiple times a day to look at it and be a little patient and um, just keep following just keep up. Checking. I mean, you do make a good point. Millions and millions of people are receiving these checks. So I'm sure there's quite a queue there. Yeah. Um, if I heard if you haven't received stimulus as of now, you will not get it until next year. Is this true? Well, um, yes and no. If you, if you had an error, it, like if you changed your bank account or you changed your address or something's different and they can't get to you and you haven't given them the new information, you will, may have to wait till next year when you file your tax return, which could be, you could file in, you know, February. But um, yeah, because today today was the deadline. May fifth was the deadline for updating any of your personal information to get the funds out to you. Uh, but there are still paper checks going out, and things are still happening. So I wouldn't say that defi definitively. If you didn't get it today, you're not going to get it. I, right. Not the case. Another question: Can undocumented people that work with an IRS number or a fake social security number get the check? Get the stimulus check. Wait, was that a, a and undocumented people that work with? I'm thinking maybe a, a tax identification number. Yeah. Or a fake social security number. Will they get the stimulus check? I undocumented. Don't I don't know about a fake. I would say fake social security number because you're not filing taxes, right? So they don't have a record of you. Or they're so filing they're under a fake number. I think is the question. Maybe. No. Um, they're filing on or so. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I, even, yeah. We can look into it and, and follow up, but I, I don't really know what their policy is on using fake social security numbers. Probably not favorable. I don't know. I see there's a comment, not so much, it doesn't look like a question, but um, Kristen said, when I applied, I took the application literally and entered my street address which they asked for and got stuck there. 
only when I entered my PO box did I find it was approved and would be mailed by May 1st. Oh. Do the addresses differ? They must have differed. So you have to you be consistent with the address you use on your tax return and your filings. Yeah. But that's good to know. So May 1st is, uh, oh, it was, wait, May 1st, they said it was going to be mailed? Yeah. So hopefully any day now. So we know there's still checks going out. Another one just popped in. Um, I did file my get my payment, but only put in one of our social security numbers because we filed jointly. Will we both get the stimulus and they will see the other person that files with you? Yes. Yep, absolutely. And then I have a question just out of curiosity because I meant you mentioned earlier that, um, Rachel, you receive somebody else's check. Mm -hmm. What should people do if they receive somebody else's check? Like, what is the process, you know? Well, I mean, I just did it out of good All faith. In your no, I mean, I could have just thrown it in the trash, or, you know? So, but what, I just wanted them, to, I knew what it was. So I just went online to whitepages.com and it was someone in my town. Thankfully, I don't live in a very big town, but um, I just called around. I looked at their name and just kept calling and asking if you are, you know, gave the names and um, we found them. And it, it was actually just the house number was transposed. So it was, and I kind of did ask them, okay, you know, I, I just want to make sure it was them. And I just did my own sleuthing and got, got yeah. to the bottom line. But for those things to get reason, like if you don't have a super person like Rachel who got your check, um, yeah. I think that they'll end up getting resolved in um, in next year. Yeah. I mean, I think it opens the door for lots of fraud. There probably is things that are going to go on and I, I don't really know the situation. Um, for, for example, I know... Um, people who file their taxes through like a tax prep service, like an H&R Block, and then they get their tax refund on a debit card. Well, that's been shown to be a problem sometimes because that debit card, so it goes to like the tax prep bank to be forwarded to the credit, the debit card for that individual taxpayer, and that card may not be open anymore. So there's lots of things like that that are stalling people's um, stimulus check arriving to them. And, you know, it has to be resolved. And I don't really know how they're going to. I don't think anyone knows. I think it's just going to have to be worked through and we'll see. And finally, do we know if we are getting a second check? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. They're talking about it. And yeah, I mean, I know the, the, the federal government, the state government, local governments, I mean, they're doing everything they can to provide us with the resources to keep us going through this time. So we might hear more news down the road. There's just nothing definitive at this point. That's all our questions for right now. Okay. So another program that we wanted to talk about has to do with unemployment insurance um, and benefits. But before we go into some of the specific details that we want to review with you today, we have another poll question. So Shai, if you could bring up the poll question and just to give us a sense as to where you are from um, you know, what you're doing in regard to work, what your status is. The question here, which of the following statements best describes your current situation? So I know over 30 million people have filed for unemployment insurance and new numbers, weekly numbers will be coming out on Thursday. Be very curious to see if the um, number of people filing is falling off or if it's continuing to go up as it has for the last few weeks. I think they're saying, you know, they're probably going to continue to go up um, as certainly as long as these stay in orders are in place for good reasons, of course. Again, just reminding folks, if you have any other questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box or the chat while we wait. So I see someone's question, employed, not an option. I think that was the first option on the, um, on the poll. That was the first answer. Oh, the working, my regular job. Yeah. 
And to self-employed, that would be considered your regu regular job. So I would check the number one box for that as well. If you haven't received, you know, recognize any reduction in pay or oh, hours. Right. Or if you're still performing your job, yeah. One question, um, a family friend didn't file taxes during 2018 or 2019. Can they still get a stimulus check? Yes, they, they will still get a stimulus check. Um, they, if they receive any type of government money like a social security, retirement income or disability income, then they already have their bank accounts. If they don't, um, then they have to get their bank account in with the um, in with uh, on the irs.gov website and for them I believe you missed the deadline yeah. today at noon was the deadline so it'll have to be done okay so we have some results here um, 77% of you, wow, that's really good news, um, are continuing working your regular job and, and without any reduction in pay or hours. 5% of you have had some reduced pay. 9% um, are furloughed, five have been laid off, and none of you have had to quit due to a family being into, well, that's really good news um, in regard to that. So we'll still talk a little, oh, 5% of you uh, are not working for pay and job responsibility. For pay, for any other reason not related to COVID-19. Okay. Oh, and so, no students on the line. So I think what we're going to do, or I know what we're going to do, is we're going to at least go in, let's show them, Erica, a little bit about, for those of you who um, might be applying for um, unemployment benefits, we just wanted to kind of go in and just show you where to go. Um, it is another opportunity for you to take advantage of these stimulus programs out there. Um, what we wanted to focus on today was um, unemployment uh, insurance for the self-employed because this was a new feature enhancement to un unemployment benefits that typically are not available to that gig economy, those self-employed individuals. And I know at the state of Massachusetts, there was a little bit of delay as to when they could go online and register because they've never been eligible for this. And Massachusetts had to go in and build this, you know, do the infrastructure online to be able to support all these. And I'm going to say kudos to them. They got it done extraordinarily efficiently. And um, you can now go online for those self-employed. I um, have a friend who is a small business owner and the, the system became eligible a little less than two weeks ago. And she went online, I think like on a Wednesday and put, and put her information and on by Tuesday of the following week, she had her unemployment benefits at her bank. So just kudos to the state of Massachusetts. Rachel, were those backdated benefits or? Um... Yes. Yeah, so when she went online, they did ask at what time, you know, at what date were you unable to perform your, your services or provide your services as a result of the COVID-19. She put in a backdate and got three weeks of um, benefits. Okay. So it really helped reduce her stress to get through this time. And um, it, you know, she was just grateful. And we were all surprised by how quickly she got it. That's awesome. So we want to take a look now at the website to see yeah. how to file. Yes. Okay, so this is the mass.gov website. And um, you see here the COVID-19 yellow tab. You would click on that. And this page is amazing. There's so many resources available to you from the um, Office of Economic Empowerment. That, that's providing you with this webinar and also just from the Commonwealth of everything that's going on in the Commonwealth. And you wanna go um, down to the bottom where it says, get help and click on unemployment insurance. And from there, you're going to apply for the pandemic unemployment assist assistance. I will say, I do want to say, so, you know, they'll ask you a lot of questions, but for the 
those self-employed individuals, it's going to ask you um, what your income, your estimated income was for 2019. And um, I know a lot of us haven't filed yet for our taxes for 2019 because they were extended through July. Uh, my friend did reach out to me and said, oh, they're telling me I needed to file my 2019 taxes before I go in here. And, and, and in fact, that's not what they need. What they want you to do is just provide um, some numbers as to what you anticipate your, you know, what your income is going to be, your net wages were for the 2019. They will also come back and ask you for, you know, proof of this. So make sure you're putting in your, you know, a, 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 your best estimate here because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you're going to have to pay any of these benefits back. Um, and it'll all net out once you file your 2019 taxes. So they'll understand what that looks like. And Rachel, like uh, someone who normally is filing unemployment, do they still have to go in every week and update their file? Yeah, so regardless as to who you are, you have to go in every week and update what your job search status has looked like. And so they will ask you questions and how you, maybe you've been impacted or your business has been impacted as a result of COVID-19. So you're just going to make sure you go in every week to keep those benefits coming. So, yeah. Okay. That's great. So it's a very simple process. Um, I don't know if you followed me to here and you just proceed and you file it and then apparently you do it on Wednesday and you get your check on, on Monday. It's that easy. But um, I want to remind everybody um, that in addition to the Massachusetts unemployment, there's also the additional $600 per week of federal unemployment ass assistance. And that ha has been extended until um, December of this year. Of course, you have to still be unemployed um, or your business closed in order to get that. If you're back to work, you can't file an un unemployment, you can't get that. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and also, as equally as important, remember, unemployment insurance benefits are taxable as income. And you need to be prepared for that. To eat. So either have taxes withheld or put money aside for, um, for the taxes. And I just, one tip to that too, my friend who filed, she filed and then I had a conversation actually with her spouse um, about taxes and he decided to make it easy. He went to his HR department because he was fully employed and he had more taxes withheld out of his paycheck because they filed jointly and it all nets out at the end of the day. So it was a really easy thing for him to do to have additional funds come out of his okay. paycheck. Do you have question? Is there a question, Shai, at this point? Or? Yes, okay. there are two. Um, grateful, mass self-employed, artisan, small business, lost entire income. All shows canceled for the foreseeable future, so this is a huge help and was easy to apply, and I got approved within two days. Great. That's That's awesome. Awesome. Um, would I be able to get unemployment if I was unemployed for a year and was looking for a job when COVID started? Were, were you collect, if you were already collecting unemployment, then no. So those rules still, um, still apply. Um, you have to wait. I'm not really sure what the waiting period is, but you have to wait whatever it is uh, before you can refile a claim. Sorry. But you still get your stimulus check. And mm -hmm. if you are a small business, maybe you can apply for a, a PPP loan of some sort or some sort of small business. In Massachusetts, they have a small business thing and they're ramping up funding on that. So there are definitely more resources available to you um, other than the unemployment. So I think if we don't have any more questions, we're going to move on to the next topic. Um, and that is debt. So Shai, if you could put up the next poll question, we want to get an idea of, you know, we are in this time of reduced income. How is debt um, happening? So do you currently have any debt? Please select all that apply. And we, we all have debt, so it's okay. I've been answering these along the way as well. Alrighty, so this question, how do they determine how much income you'll get for self-employed persons when filed through DUA? It's not 50% like regular workers get. And when I start to go back to work, it could be slower and working less. Can I collect and work when starting back up? I'm assuming like 
when things start to slowly reopen? Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, that's, that's an uh, unemployment department question that I imagine there's going to be some income test to it that will determine how long you can continue to work. So for example, if you were collecting unemployment and you um, were able to find a job, a small part-time job for like five hours a week, there's a certain amount of money you can make that's not gonna impact your benefits. So yeah. I imagine the same thing will be true for self-employed people. And they do, they do ask you that question. They are gonna ask you, you know, all right, did you make any money this week? And that might impact your income, your benefit on a week to week basis. Yeah, right. So it could change on a weekly basis based on how much money you made. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. So here's the the um, student loan. The response: ten percent people have student loan debt. Seventy percent have mortgage debt. Fifty only fifty percent have credit card debt. Again, twenty five have other. And 15% have no debt at all. So it, that's it's so great to, to all of you. <laughs> um, that's, that's awesome. So what we want to do now is we want to talk about ways for you to manage your debt during this difficult time. For most people, and also according to that poll, first of all, your biggest asset for most people is your home, which makes your biggest debt your mortgage. And the CARES Act has made available a tool or resources to help you uh, manage this large debt that you might have in the form of a forbearance. So what a forbearance is, it's, it's a period of time, it's like you're putting your mortgage payment on hold, on pause. It's not to exceed 180 days. And um, at the end of that period of time, whatever it is, three months, six months, you are allegedly, you have to pay the money back that you did not pay while you had the forbearance granted to you from your mortgage provider. And in the CARES Act, what they have said is at the end of the forbearance that you can go back to the bank and um, look at a um, other means to continue a forbearance or maybe look at a deferral or a loan uh, remodification. A deferral versus the forbearance means you take those missed payments and you stack them on the back end of your loan and extend the loan however many months. So it would now be a 30 or six month loan. But it always starts with the forbearance and then you have to renegotiate. So you still have to be in dire straits to have continue through another form of, of um, deferring that mortgage payment. Yeah, I think the, the, to understand what the forbearance means technically is at the end of that forbearance period, you're going to owe, you know, those three months of payments that you weren't paying. So you really need to make sure you understand that, work with your lender to work out different terms at the end of the day, because who's really going to have three months of mortgage payments just hanging out at the end of that forbearance period. So just be really smart and informed and make the extra steps to work with your lender. So you yeah. don't have to in a bad It's really about communicating with them keeping in touch so they know what's going on with you. Yeah. Um, another way to help manage some debt, and I, I know there were some students out there, was um, your student loan debt. You know, Erica, you and I talked to so many young Americans out there who are burdened with unbelievable student loan debt. It's overwhelming. And I know every one of them um, are so proud of the work that they've done and are so committed to paying those loans back, but I really feel like they never get any sort of break. Uh, but here's an opportunity. The CARES Act has um, allowed for deferral, not forbearance, deferral of your student loan payments through September of this year. And I encourage any student out there who has debt, take advantage of this opportunity just to sort of like take a deep breath, not pay those payments and know, you know, you're going to be okay. You're not going to be penalized. Um, another opportunity, and this depends on your lender, but if you have credit card debt, um, a lot of credit card um, uh, companies are offering a little bit of a wiggle room in regards to the payment. So I reached out to mine. Um, I have American Express and they told me that I would not have to make a payment for the month of May and then just pick up my payments 
in the month of June, not double payment in the month of June, but just to make that one, that June minimum payment, no penalty, no, no interest. So, I mean, it's just amazing how everyone's coming together, trying to get us through this um, and keep us strong financially. And I, I do want to note too, with these three programs, the one you talked about, Erica, the forbearance, the student loan and the credit card, none of these are going to go on your credit report. We know how important it is to stay in good standing and have a good credit score. So none of these um, opportunities here that we've talked about are going to be uh, have, a, have a negative impact on your credit score. That's key because you're going to want to borrow again in the future. You need a good score. Um, lastly, if you already have a loan from your 401k out and you're making those payments, um, you can suspend those through uh, the end of this year and into next year. Or if you um, have to take a 401k loan out to make ends meet now, you know that those payments can be deferred till next year. But do remember that those do have to be paid back from your earnings and you want to just be aware of that, that you're not uh, overextending yourself and then leaving yourself short on the other side. Right. Empower yourself by asking all the right questions when you reach out for these opportunities. Okay. So we're going to go to another poll question. Shai, if you want to put up uh, this. And now we're moving on from debt to savings. And since everyone was in such good shape on the debt question, I expect good <laughs> answers on the savings as well. Do you have money saved or are you, uh, for any of the following goals? Or are you currently saving money for any of the following goals? While that is up, we have one question. It's about unemployment. If I am collecting unemployment and I am trying to take my business online, but there are costs before I even begin and I maybe make a little amount of money, where do the upfront tax expenses factor in? So I'm trying to understand how they might be able to fund the startup that they're working on, I guess. That's Can you re re read it? Shai, I'm sorry. Re if I'm collecting unemployment mm -hmm. and I'm trying to take my business online, yeah. but there are costs before I even begin, and I maybe make a little bit of money, yeah. where do the upfront expenses factor in? Oh, I see. So as far as um, having income and then having your unemployment um, uh, reduced because of the income, can you factor in the expenses and I'm going to say yes, just like any tax return, as a self-employed person, you get to deduct your expenses and only pay tax on, you know, as long as they're deductible expenses. So starting up a business would be deductible. So I would imagine that that would offset the income, be used to offset the income until the expenses were all used. Yeah, because they're going to... I know we're not tax we're not CPAs. I just want to say that that just makes sense to me based on you know the fact that uh, that's how business you know self-employed right. people. They're going to want to know what your net receipts are. So net receipts are income minus expenses. You know expenses. So that's a number that they're looking for. That's it for right now. Great. Did we get an answer to the poll? Oh, here we go. Oh, so people have, 81% of people have emergency. Wow. 19% are saving for a large purchase, 5% for education, 57% for retirement, 14 other, and 19% um, don't have any money saved. So that does, so that's, wow, that's great. I mean, strong, strong. Yeah. It's really good to see. So one of the silver linings of what we're all going through is the amount of money that we're not spending mm -hmm. and on things that we just did as part of our normal life. This is an opportunity, a real opportunity to make a difference going forward in your life by using a budget. Um, Rachel and I have been working with families for a long time and I have to say it's amazing the amount of people who do not use a budget is staggering and it, it just surprises me because the but it's the foundation of a um, a 
strength to strengthen your bottom line and to go forward. And it's a reason, a lack of a budget can be a very big reason why people get into trouble with credit cards. It's because they have no understanding at all of what they make and what they spend and how it all balances out. So we're gonna introduce a tool to you and talk about budgeting right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the basics of a budget, you, you do a budget because you wanna know how much is coming in and how much should go out. And if more goes out than comes in, that's where you get yourself in trouble. So I, we, we've been you know, talking to so many people and just trying to understand, you know, we're all in a different, you know, a lot of us are in a different financial state right now because we, maybe we've lost our jobs or because we're not spending as much. So we thought that we would look at a, uh, doing a budget with you or just kind of give you an idea, but do it for the current environment that we're in. You know, let's really take a look at where our money is coming from and going to these days and prepare a budget for this next phase. So for the next six to 12 months, you obviously are going to want to revisit it at any point where there's a significant change in your life. But I think this is a really good foundation for us to get through this next phase of this um, COVID-19 world that we're living in. So one of the first and most important things that you do on a budget is you decide, you look at where's your money coming from right now? And you want to identify that. And I think just writing down these numbers is a, an, an amazing exercise that's really going to help you focus and be consistent in your, in your budgeting. So look at how much you're bringing in. So there's a lot of you whose income has not been impacted right now or it's remained consistent. Make note of what your income is on a monthly basis. Make note of what your spouse's income is. If you have unemployment in your life right now, put that down, make note of what that income is. If you have any dividend and interest income or other income, you wanna highlight that. So are you, um, maybe you're, you own rental properties and you're getting rental income, or maybe you get alimony or child support. Identify all these different sources and tally them up so you know what's coming into the household on a month to month basis, especially during these times. A question, Shai? Yes, somebody asked, what happens if your income is variable? Yeah, so I mean, that's just something you you have to manage. I mean, you could look at a 12 month period and, you know, um, you know, divide it by 12. Or what I would always, you know, Eric and I always are on the conservative side and just put in, you know, lowball those numbers and mm -hmm. put them in your budget. That's always my advice. And then if there's more then you're, you know, more than what you budgeted, then it's only going to put you in a stronger position. And I would suggest if you have a variable income, a budget is even more important for you because because um, what we're, now what we're going to look at is the expenses. Yeah. So um, on so uh, for many of us, our incomes have changed, but also our expenses have changed as well. And as I said, we're spending um, maybe a little less money on what we call discretionary items. So your expenses fall into two categories: your essential. Uh, expenses that you need every single month, no matter what, you know, a roof over your head, food on your table, um, you know, whatever, whatever those are, health insurance, those things you cannot do without. And then your discretionary expenses, those are the things that um, we have probably been saving money on and um, you can have a little more play. So you want to go through and you want to understand what um, what they all are and you want to write them down. This particular um, spreadsheet shows you have monthly and annually, but you can get versions of a spreadsheet that do it out month by month because we all know, you know, sometimes you have quarterly expenses or, or whatever, but the more detailed and the more accurate your budget and your expenses can be, um, the better off you are. You know, we always, we deal with people doing financial plans and have them submit their expenses to us. And they're almost never right. I would say maybe one time someone got it right because everyone always underestimates what they're. Um, yeah. And I think we're at this moment in time where we're really looking at our money and we're really looking at what's coming in and going out and saying, oh, I don't necessarily need all of these things. So I, I think this is a great time to take advantage of this exercise. Absolutely. So we have things that we're saving that our expenses have gone down. Um, but so I, I don't know, Rachel, what have what have you saved money on? I mean, I've saved a lot. I don't go anywhere. I just sit in this home office and I know you and I have talked. I mean, typically I would 
commute into Boston and fill my gas tank up twice a week. So, I mean, that alone is a huge savings. And I'm sure there's a lot of us that are able to, you know, save money from just um, a commuting expense. Um, and also, this was a nice surprise for me this weekend. I got some um, refunds on, I have three young kids and they're all in sports, but this spring they couldn't participate. So I got some really nice refunds back for those spring sports. So it's these little things that make a difference and are only going to help, um, you know, from a financial perspective, hopefully all of us. That's great. That's great. What about you, Erica? Have you... Um, well, I have to say that there's not an item in my refrigerator that goes unused these days. I've become the queen of smoothies in the morning and stir fries at night. You can just take anything that you have and throw it in there and it works. It's perfect for being considerate and not wasteful. And I think that's, yeah, that's right. a huge, it's a huge yeah. thing to end. Plus it keeps you probably out of the stores a little yeah. bit you know so um that's good we would love to hear what you all are doing where you're finding um you where you're saving a little bit money as well and hopefully you're all finding opportunities so again the whole point of this budget is to say okay what's coming in what's going out how maybe am i saving money during this this period and you know where where do i end up at the end of the day so you take your total income and you um minus your expenses and you're either going to have a surplus or shortfall. And I would say, you know, if you have a, a surplus, look at opportunities to um, invest, create a, a, a more solid financial foundation for yourself. Um, I know with the, you know, for example, the refunds on the sports for my kids, I'm putting that in their 529. Here's an opportunity for me to put more money into their 529s. You, know, you can create an emergency fund. You can pay down some of that credit card debt or do a little bit of both, you know, put half of your surplus towards that emergency fund, half towards that credit card debt. I mean, there's a really good opportunity. We should take advantage of, you know, positioning ourselves to strengthen our financial picture. Absolutely. And then if there's a shortfall, Erica, what would you recommend? Well, before we go to the shortfall, um, I know I listened to a piece this morning and they talked about, they were interviewing uh, people in Massachusetts about what they were doing with the stimulus check. And there are a lot of people who said that they were um, putting, giving some money to charity. And yeah. That's today true. Is what, Rachel? <laughs> yeah, that's because today is um, Giving Back Tuesday, um, and and it's a really good opportunity to you know recognize this and recognize all of our essential workers or any sort of local charity. I know I have talked to people who got their stimulus check back and are making a um, are going to make a, a donation. And today's a great day to do it since it's yeah Tuesday, Giving Back Give Back Tuesday. And I know I have made a donation. Um, Boston has a fund directly that you can donate to to help people, but a lot of the cities in, in the Commonwealth have them. So you can go online to your city um, government if that is important to you and you wanna do that. Um, so, but let's, if you don't have a surplus, you have a shortfall, you know, uh, these are tough times to give tough love, but always um, my response to a budgeting shortfall is you have two choices. You can um, earn more money or you can spend less. And this is a time where we can't necessarily, uh, we don't have the ability to go out and get a second or a third job. So we're forced to cutting those expenses. And that's where the budget tool comes into play. And you just go back and it's an exercise and, every, and, and people do it. You say, okay, this is this is discretionary. It's not essential for me to have, um, you know, Hulu and Netflix and whatever. Well, maybe that is uh, it's essential now, but <laughs> you get what I'm saying. So those are really what you do for um, a, a shortfall in your in your budget. So, but just because that you can't go out and get a job now doesn't mean that in um, the future as we come out of this pandemic, you should still be using this budgeting tool. And um, that would be my response to you then. Yeah, it, it's a working document. It's not a fixed tool. You can change your budget at any time, but I think it's just, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of the, the financial situation that we're all in and look for opportunities. Yeah, find yeah. a silver lining. So, I mean, that's what we have for today. I don't know if there's any more questions. We're more than happy to answer them. We've come up almost on the full hour. Oh, there's, okay, we have questions. We have folks that are requesting um, tools that you recommend for budgeting. Mm -hmm. So we, our office or. 
Yeah, you can reach out to our office, Sean. Maybe you can put um, our emails in there. I mean, and again, I know there's a lot of tools online, but we're happy to provide with you with any of these resources. We actually have other budgeting tools that are really in depth. If that was you really wanted to dig deep, we could um, provide you with a much more detailed opportunity, you know, spreadsheet to collect those expenses. We will, um, I'll make sure that we provide Erica and Rachel's contact information in the follow-up email. So if you registered, you will be receiving that. Um, if you don't get that for whatever reason, you can always email us at moneytalk at tre.state.ma.us. I can put it in the chat box. Um, we did get another question. Is there any protection from foreclosure? Um, yeah, so I know there are some, um, protections on foreclosure at this during this time. Uh, I know the mass.gov website has a lot of information on it and I've looked at some of it, um, but there's sort of, you know, there's no actions being taken. There's sort of a hold on any of these foreclosures or, um, you know, evictions at this point. And um, I know there's been a stay on like evictions through um, August, I believe. And so, you know, just do your due diligence, talk to your lenders, there are opportunities. I mean, if you can do a forbearance, then you, you know, should be able to, you know, for this moment in time, you know, work through any sort of foreclosure, but definitely opportunities out there available to you to keep you in your home at this time. No one, no one will lose their home during this period of time for lack of payment. Um, your landlord can still communicate with you and still let you know what you owe, but they can't, um, they can't throw you out at this time for having not paid it. At some point though, you have to pay it. <laughs> Just gonna give folks another 60 seconds if they wanted to ask a question, you guys can ask the question now. Um, just so everybody is aware, we will be sending out a link to today's presentation, um, contact information for Rachel and Erica, as well as the Office of Economic Empowerment. We will also be releasing a survey. So once you guys exit out, you guys can give us some feedback. And if you have suggestions for a future topic, you can also um, submit it through that. Or like I said, you can email us at moneytalk at tre.state.ma.us. I did drop that in the chat. And looks like we got a question. Can you please share the in-depth budgeting tool? Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, just um, email us and we can get that out to you. It's an Excel spreadsheet, so um, we can send that to you, no problem. And I just want to say on the future topics, I meant to mention this earlier, next week is there's one on student loan. So a great opportunity for those of you who have student loan debt, trying to manage this time or, you know, looking into that, I would definitely recommend. I mean, it's a good way to, you know, understand your, how you budget those into your, into your situation. So that will be next week's Money Talk Tuesday is going over student debt, navigating that during all of this uncertainty. Um, and then in June, we'll also be doing another student debt related one around loan forgiveness. Um, those are very two, two heavy topics that we had to break it down into two yes. webinars. So look out for those. Folks are saying thanks for the presentation. Thank you guys all for coming. If there's no other questions, I think it's safe to say this is a wrap, ladies. Thank yeah. you, Erica yeah. and Rachel, so much. Thank you to all of our attendees. I hope you found a lot of this information useful or helpful. Um, feel free to share the link with folks once you receive it um, because we're sharing information. So Great. thanks, Guy, for organizing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.